for the Daily Radio News on WKUF, I'm David Jackson for Tuesday, May 31st, 2016. A Michigan Senate bill overhauling the state's energy policy could cost Michigan energy customers up to $4 billion. Emily Lawler on MLive.com reports that the Michigan Environmental Council released a study that, according to their own estimations, could cost billions if certain so-called green measures are not utilized. The group estimates that over the next decade, customers could be charged an additional $2 billion if smart meters are not implemented to reduce peak demand. Another $700 million could be overcharged if energy supply companies fail to take advantage of renewable energy, and another $1 billion could be lost from incentive payments to Michigan power companies that encourage customer energy efficiency. The MEC was joined yesterday in Lansing by other special interest groups, including the Michigan Freedom Fund and Americans for Prosperity, to oppose the energy bill currently being debated in the Michigan Senate. Each of the special interest groups advocate for their own agendas, including further use of alternative energy, tariff equity, costs, and expanded energy competition. But according to Pete Lund, state director of the AFP, the one thing that all the groups gathered can agree on is they oppose this bill. Michigan Senator Mike Knopfs, however, was adamant last week in saying that the bill currently being reviewed in the Senate keeps competition alive, preserves an alternative energy policy in place since 2008, and also places requirements on alternative energy suppliers to ensure reliability. A U.S. appeals court ruled on Tuesday that police do not need a warrant to obtain cell phone location data from U.S. carriers. Reuters reports that the 4th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in Richmond, Virginia, voted 12 to 3 that a decades-old precedent saying that the data had already been disclosed to a third party applies to cell phone location data and is therefore exempt from requiring a warrant. The decision deals a severe setback to privacy advocates and overturns a 2015 split opinion from the same court's three-person panel of judges that likely prevents the U.S. Supreme Court from hearing the case. Writing for the majority... Judge Diane Motz says that obtaining cell site information did not violate the Fourth Amendment because cell phone users are generally aware that they are voluntarily sharing that data with their provider. Dissenting, however, Judge James Wynn said that users do not specifically submit their location data the same way they would when dialing a phone number or depositing money into a bank, and therefore the data should be exempt from the third-party doctrine that was designed for more traditional records. What this means is that anytime someone uses a cell phone, the courts are assuming that a person knows that they have no right to privacy and the constitutional protections against unreasonable searches and seizures, from the perspective of cell phone location data, are forfeit. More evidence is mounting that links high blood pressure with common air pollutants. The U.S. News and World Report wrote that a review of 17 studies conducted worldwide each assessed a possible link between between blood pressure and common pollutants, such as car exhaust, indoor and outdoor chemical sprays, smog, and airborne dirt or dust. Tao Lu, a director at the Guangdong Provincial Institute of Public Health in Guangzhou, China, says that results from their study show that air pollutants had both short- and long-term effects on high blood pressure risks, noting that even a few days of increased air pollutants could lead to spikes in blood pressure and long-term exposure could cause chronically high blood pressure. Investigations were conducted in Brazil, Canada, Germany, Sweden, and the U.S., and Dr. Greg Fonerau, a professor of cardiology at UCLA, agreed with the findings, saying that the study results underscore a need for actually clean air, not just clean-smelling air. And finally, in election news, apparently, an op-ed published in North Korea's state media praised the so-called wise commentary of Donald Trump. The Washington Times reports that reality TV star Donald Trump said that he would be open to direct talks with Kim Jong-un, leader of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, to halt the nation's nuclear program. After Trump made his remarks, a self-proclaimed North Korean scholar published a piece praising the Republican primary frontrunner on the government-run tourism propaganda website DPRK Today. In the piece, Han Yong-muk said that there were many positive aspects to Trump's inflammatory rhetoric, noting that the former casino owner's intentions to not get involved in a war between the North and South Korea would be fortunate from his nation's perspective. In a March speech, Mr. Trump told a rally that he would consider withdrawing military troops based in North South Korea if Seoul does not start paying more for its own defense costs. In his article, Mr. Han slammed Mrs. Clinton for supposedly favoring the so-called Iranian method of sanctions to curb nuclear programs rather than direct leader-to-leader talks. The opinion piece does not necessarily reflect the North Korea's official line, but since it was approved by Pyongyang's censors and printed in one of the nation's propaganda magazines, it suggests that Kim's government may be keenly interested in the outcome of the upcoming presidential race. 
With the Daily Radio News, I'm David Jackson with Flint Local News. Flint's top financial officer, Jody Lundquist, has tendered her resignation. Jaquanda Johnson of the Flint Journal reports that Lundquist was the last official left that was appointed under the state-appointed emergency manager. Flint City Councilman Scott Kincaid says that the city is essentially back to home rule now, adding that he hates to see the finance director leave, but it's probably in her best interest under the Weaver administration. Councilman Eric May says that he is concerned that she would resign amidst the ongoing budget process, noting, however, that Lundquist did give three weeks' notice in order to assure that the city of Flint administrators can complete the current budget process. City of Flint spokeswoman Kristen Moore says that no decision has been made yet regarding an interim CFO. However, a replacement is expected expected to be pulled from within the finance department. Mayor Karen Weaver's monthly town hall meeting was held last night at the Bethel United Methodist Church. Amanda Emery of the Flint Journal reports that a panel of officials joined Mayor Weaver to discuss the state of the lead pipe replacement program, the expansion of Medicaid benefits to Flint area residents, and the expansion of the Double Up Bucks program at local grocers. According to Kathleen Falk of the regional U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Fair Food Network will be expanded to a number of area grocery stores. Falk says this means that area residents can get an additional amount per day for using the SNAP card for buying fresh produce. Falk noted that nutritious foods, including fresh produce, have the ability to assist in removing toxins from the body. And City of Flint purchasing manager Derek Jones says that the city is working to complete the request for proposals from potential contractors to replace lead pipes in the city. A team of scientists and researchers gathered in Flint last night to assure residents that bathing in city water is likely safe. Roberto Acosta of the Flint Journal reports that Virginia Tech professor Mark Edwards told an audience that recent tests have showed that lead levels are dropping and offered that Legionnaire's disease can likely be killed if water is heated to 140 degrees. With the Daily Radio News, I'm David Jackson with sports scores and headlines on WKUF 94.3. The Detroit Tigers dropped their fourth straight game last night in Anaheim with an 11-9 loss. Anaheim's pitching staff were lit up with five home runs last night, including Miguel Cabrera, who went yard with two outs in the first, and Ian Kinsler hitting a grand slam off of Cam Pedrosian in the seventh. Kinsler's grand slam brought Detroit to within one of the Angels, and Victor Martinez homered to right to tie the game in the eighth. But in last night's slugfest, Detroit's pitching staff gave up four home runs, including in the bottom of the ninth when C.J. Cron hit a walk-off home run off of reliever Mark Lowe to beat the Tigers 11-9. With that loss, according to Anthony Fennick of the Detroit Free Press, the Tigers have dropped 17 of their last 19 in Anaheim. The Tigers play again this evening against the Anaheim Angels with a 7.05 start. For more information about today's stories, visit WKUF.FM. I'm David Jackson.